Well, good morning once again. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll be finding James chapter 3, James chapter 3, that's where we're going to begin. And my wife was joking with me this morning. We normally don't discuss the sermon. I don't want her to hear it twice. <laughs> but uh, she said, what's it on this morning? And of course, she knows I'm an Andy Griffith fan, and she always goes, sin. I go, yeah, uh, can't get enough of that. But no, uh, I had to ask God. It hadn't been that long ago since we had a sermon very similar to this. And I said, God, they're going to get tired of me saying the same thing. And, of course, like I tell you all the time, most of these sermons he's given to me for my life, and I'm just sharing it with you, and it's just like in my heart. He said, well, maybe you'll listen <laughs> this time. So maybe I'll listen this time. But I began to look around the world as I prayed God would open my eyes, and I said, you know, show me how we got to where we're at today. Because, folks, I think you'll agree with me. We're not in a good place. Our nation, our world, we're not in a good place. And... It's like he began to take me into scripture and show me, and, and, and this word we've talked about before, but, but we're going to talk about it today and use some different scriptures, and the word is selfish. It is look, lacking consideration for others, concerned chiefly with one's own personal profit or pleasure. You'll agree with me, the people of this world that are not of Christ, they are the ones of this world, they're selfish, and they only care, care about themselves. And it does not matter to them that their neighbor is drowning in this world. If, if you wondered how our world got here, well, we got focused on ourselves and we quit caring about others. And I, I had to chuckle at this inside my heart this morning because you know I'm like Gideon. I like God to show me and show me and show me again. Well, this morning as I began to listen to the Sunday school lesson, and it talked about Abraham and Lot, and they came to the decision and... and uh, they, their herds got too big and they, they, they couldn't dwell any longer together. So Abraham, who you remember, Abraham was the one that God promised the land to. But what did Abraham do? He let Lot choose. He said, at, Lot was his nephew. And I mean, I can just hear him. He said, son, you look out there and you choose what's best for you. Does that sound like a selfish man to you? Absolutely not. Abraham was a man of God. So I'm going to tell you something this morning. If you're a selfish person, I'm going to challenge you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, are you a child of God or are you just simply giving him lip service? Because a true child of God will not be a selfish person. Abraham was not so Abraham had every right to take what land he wanted, but he said, you know, he said, son, you take it. Now we all know what happened. Lot should have let Abraham. He should have said, no, sir, it's, it's your choice. But he took the choice. And what did he pick? He picked. He picked what looked to him to be the best land. But you know the rest of the story. You know what, what was in what he picked, Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, it ended up costing him his wife and his property. It cost him everything he had. Folks, selfishness is just like unforgiveness. It will eat you alive. Because if you're selfish, what do you want? You want everything you can get. Is there enough of this world to satisfy us? Absolutely not. If you look for the things of this world to satisfy you, you're going to wind up in a place that you never wanted to be. You know, I, we used to put on presentations and stuff at the school, and there was this one, and I can't remember the name of it, but there was this young boy on there, and you could obviously tell he was in prison and he was speaking. And he said, you know, when I was in high school, he said, my desire was never to be in prison. My desire was never to be a drug addict. But that's where he wound up because of the decisions he made. And, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You will never go wrong putting somebody else ahead of you. You will never go wrong because why? You say, why is that so, Pastor? Because Jesus Christ, the maker of all, come down over 2,000 years ago and put every one of us in front of him when he hung on that cross. And my Bible tells me that we are to be Christ-like. That means we must put others ahead of us. Now, I'm going to go through some scriptures today and share some things with you, but I just want you to have that mindset as we move into this word today. Look around this world. How much selfishness do you see? <laughs> A great deal. Unfortunately, 
If you look in the church, you're going to find a lot of selfishness today. You're going to find a lot of people that it's just about them. They may, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about our church today. I'm talking about the church as a whole. But folks, we got to be honest with ourselves as well. Where does judgment begin? It begins at the house of God. And you say, where is that? If you're, this morning, if you're a child of God, you can raise your hand because that judgment starts with us. We are the ones that have to be honest. You know, I don't care how beautiful somebody can sing if they come up here or they come to any alt or any stage in this on any in any church this morning. If they're singing for their own glory, they're selfish. If they're singing to, to for people to look at them, they're selfish. If they get up and say something or do something for people to look at them and admire them, they're selfish. We are supposed to direct all glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, I'm going to tell you something. If you're sitting under the sound of my voice this morning and you have that hope that you're going to heaven, you owe it all to Jesus Christ. And friend, if you're sitting here this morning and you don't have that hope, you owe it all to Jesus Christ because you can still have it today. Jesus Christ is our only hope. If you would this morning, if you would turn with me to James chapter 3. And when you find that this morning, if you would stand to honor the reading of God's word. We're going to get right into it this morning. James chapter 3. And I'm going to start in verse number 13. James chapter 3 verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for the Sunday school lesson this morning and the messenger you sent it to us through. Lord, we thank you for these the beautiful songs and these children standing and quoting your word and singing your praises in, in this house, God. But Lord, now it comes, the preaching of your word. And God, I ask you from the bottom of my heart, forgive me of my sins, God. Cleanse me with your blood. Holy Spirit, God, I pray you rise up in me. And use this vessel to speak your word in a way that is understandable and clear. And God, I pray that you open up our ears of our hearts and our minds today. And speak directly to us and help us, Lord, leave here closer to you than when we showed up. And Lord, help us live our lives in a way that brings others to you and glorifies you. In Jesus' precious name, his church prayed. I want to read this to you again, part of it. Because you'll agree it involves not only our world, but so many churches today. There's so many churches fighting. I found this out, and I, I, I had no idea this was true, but I looked it up. Did you realize in the 1990s in America, over 900,000 churches closed? Folks, that's a lot of churches. But listen to what it says. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. May I rephrase that this morning. If you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, you better not be happy because you're lost. Lie not against the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So folks, that again, that means the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And listen what it says. If you have this stuff in your life this morning, you better get it right. Listen to me this morning. Envying, strife in your hearts, glory not. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish, if you believe that stuff is okay. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Again, would you agree, if you watch any kind of media, you would agree that in our nation we have envying and strife. No longer can anybody get along. Everybody hates everybody. If you don't agree with how somebody believes, they hate you. It's no longer you could sit down and have a cup of coffee and, and discuss your differences. It's either, it, it's, it's like Burger King. It's my way or the highway. Folks, but let me tell you, let me show you the danger in that. 
That is, it is one thing not to agree on political issues. That's been around for as long as it's been a world, amen? We cannot, cannot disagree on the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And we live in a world where now, if you believe that, they hate you. They hate the truth. They want nothing to do with the truth. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I see it coming. There is a time coming where when you stand for the truth, you will be persecuted. You will be hated. You will be attacked. But let me tell you something. Whatever happens, you do not back down from the truth. You do not fail to stand for God because the minute you do, my Bible tells me if I'm ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of me. And how much, I heard y'all talking about trust this morning in Sunday school. How much do you trust God? Do you trust God enough if, if our world turns, and every one of us can see this now, we're just a few, folks, we're just an election away from uh, Christianity being outlawed. And, when, and then like gatherings like this, they will come after us. They've already announced the first thing they're going to come after is every church in their financial. They, they want the church's money. Folks, we, there's, this, this is not political. This, we face evil. They are attacking God, and they are openly attacking God, and we have one mission, and that is to stand up for God. And, we, and, and how do you stand up for God? You do it on your knees, amen? You hit that prayer closet, you pray, and you sincerely pray. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I've already told you about them flying Billy Graham to the Capitol. When this world goes to hell, and, folks, it will, there will be many crying out, hey, pray to that God. Pray to your God. They don't know him, but they know that he's there. I pray that more and more of them find him. And, folks, if that's what it takes... If that's what it takes for us to see more people come to God, then it'll be a blessing. It's not going to be an enjoyable blessing. Because I can tell you a few people is going to suffer if it goes the wrong way. That's the church. That's the law enforcement. That's the schools. That's all you young people that, that have jobs and, and work and earn money and want to buy your own house and stuff like that. They're coming after you. They're coming after you, but they're coming after Christians. And folks, they're no longer hiding it. The, the enemy is no longer behind the bush. The enemy is out in our face. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We will win, church. Do not quit. Do not give up. Uh, but our world, it is so full of this envying and strife and many evil works. You'll agree with me. We used to live in a time when people truly were concerned for their neighbor and would help them any way they could. I saw this just this morning. This tells me everything I need to know about this world. This is not a pleasant story, but I'm going to share it with you. There was a Wells Fargo office inside the United States of America this past week where a lady passed away at her cubicle. She was there four days before anybody found her. Four days. Workers not paying any, walking by. How can you not see that? And, I, I, and then God began to speak to me. It speaks about the last days and the blindness. I don't mean to be, I don't mean to gross any of you out, but I think it's important that we realize this. This lady died at her desk and sat there four days. You know why they began to notice her? Smell. smell. Folks, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but we live in a world that smells, amen? They try to sell us all this what was it uh, President Reagan said? The worst words you could ever hear is, we're from the government, we're here to help. Yes. Amen. I smell something cooking, don't you? And it's not Jesus Christ, and it's not the Word of God. And it stinks. And folks, we can either lay down and take it, or we can stand for God and realize that is a very graphic example. But now, I don't want to look at the government this morning. I want to look at the church, which, folks, that's us. This lady physically died in a cubicle and was there four days before anybody noticed. 
How many of your neighbors, if they died today, would go to hell? And you drive by their house every Sunday, and you never stop and tell them about Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm as guilty as anybody. It's time we wake up. You know, I've heard people put it this way, and I heard this this week, and it really touched my heart. What happens a lot of time when you witness to somebody that's lost about Christ? They view you as what? Like you're condemning to them. Now, don't get me wrong. I have had people witness to me before, and they were very condemning to me. And that don't, that, that's not my God. But a lot of times when you tell them about how good God is or, you know, how for their life, they see, they think you are, that you think, you think you're better than they are. This is how it comes across sometimes. I heard this this week, and this is the best way to look at it. If you're under my sound of my voice this morning and you're, and you're a born-again saved Christian, praise God, number one. But number two, don't ever put yourself somewhere where you don't belong. Because, folks, every one of us are sinners. And it's only by the grace of God that we've been saved. So look at it this way. It's not us as being righteous trying to fix the unrighteous. It's us beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. Amen? Let that sink in a little bit, folks, because that's what we all are. Praise God, we found the bread of life. Our, our whole goal for the rest of our life is to share where we found that bread. Amen? And do it out of love. But, you know, I'm not even going to talk about any of you that's been here more than, a, more than a year, you know my favorite two things in this world is Walmart and Facebook. I'm not going to talk about either one of them this morning. I'm just going to talk about a pure, greedy selfishness. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way or not, but you know one of the sure signs of selfishness in your life. I'm going to say this slowly because this is going to slap some of us right square in the face a sure sign of that you have a selfish heart is if you have unforgiveness in your heart I wasn't expecting any amens a sure sign of selfishness in your life is if you refuse to forgive people no matter what they've done why? Because you hold yourself at a higher level than you hold God. And you're holding yourself at a higher level than you hold them. Folks, we are all beggars looking for the same bread. And I know some people have done us all wrong, but guess what? We've done people wrong as well. But none of us have been wronged as much as Jesus Christ. And folks, we should be like Stephen. If you don't know the story of Stephen... He was stoned for spreading the gospel of Christ. He was stoned to death. And as, before he died, he mimicked Christ. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Folks, we're selfish. We live in a world. Everywhere we look, there's selfishness. I told you one time the best illustration I can think of is walk into a first or second grade class of 20 or 25 kids and open up a pizza box and there's eight pieces. What's going to happen? The eight quickest are going to be eating. They're not going to look around and go, well, there's little Sally. Her mom and daddy don't feed her much. I'm going to let her go. Or, I've got stuff to eat at home. I'm, that don't happen, does it? They're children. People say they don't know better. They ought to. It's our responsibility to teach them. But, how do we teach them when we act just like them? Folks, we are so... We think we're old stuff. And everywhere you look, there's people... Well, you know... I. I really began to see it right before I retired 
in some of the background investigations I do, and people would come in and sit in front of me wanting my organization to hire them and them tell me what they needed us to do for them. <laughs> I was like, I tell you what we're going to do for you. You're going to get a paycheck. Other than that, you do what they say. You don't get to dictate what you do and what you don't. You see how selfish we've become? Folks, we've put ourselves on a plane that we don't belong because we are beggars of bread. And I can tell you one thing. There's one thing I can tell you for sure about everybody in this room right now. And everybody, God has never failed you. Ever. Nor will he ever fail you. Now, folks, can we get ourselves in a bind? You betcha. Can we dig our own hole? Amen. I've got a good shovel if any of you need to borrow it. I, I've dug a many for myself. But here's the thing. Even when I'm climbing out of a hole I dug, he'll reach down and get me. Folks, I know this isn't pleasant this morning, but it's true. We're selfish. This and this unforgiveness, it goes hand in hand. And, and a lot of times, how we feel about somebody that has wronged us speaks volumes about who we are. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. May I tell you, that was one of my greatest struggles that I had to have the Holy Spirit give me the power to lay it down. I think I've shared this story with you before, but it's kind of funny, but it shows you exactly who I was. I was pulling out of the office one day, and for those of you that don't know, I never, I never had a siren. I never had a light. I didn't really want you to know that I was the police. Uh, I realized it cost me some discounts at restaurants. Uh, uh, but anyway, the whole point, I thought, was for people to not know who we were. But anyway, I was pulling out of the office one day, and this guy was pulling out of the tobacco shop right beside me. Clearly, he did not know the laws of the Arkansas road because I had the right of way. I was pulling out of a road, and he was pulling out of a parking lot, and I didn't even get close to him anyway. I was turning right, and he turned left in front of me. So I stopped and let him go, and he honked, and I guess he really liked me because he told me I was number one. And so that went all over me. So I was not quoting 1 Thessalonians 5.15. I'm just going to be real honest as your pastor. That was not the verse running through my head. So I U-turned across three or four lanes of traffic, violated those laws that I said he didn't know, and I went after him. And he realized that I was after him, so he began to speed up. And Chris has been with me on one of these tours of duty before when you run out of brakes, and it's really interesting. But anyway, I'm chasing this man down 64, and then it's like God said, what are you going to do when you catch him? And I'm like, well, I'm going to break that middle finger, God. <laughs> uh, and it's like, he just began to melt me. Who am I? Who do I represent? What should I really be doing? I should really be praying for that man. Because he don't have the peace and assurance that I do. And he showed me a lot that day. Folks, I'm not saying it's easy. And we, we will fail sometimes. But my Bible tells me that if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. You ever wondered why that word faithful's in there? Because he'll do it time and time and time again. You see, to abide by 1 Thessalonians 5.15, only a selfless, selfless person can do that. I hate to admit it to you, but I'm not always selfless. The only way we can be selfless, church, is to allow the Holy Spirit dominion in our life. He does not need to be a passenger in our vehicle. He needs to be the pilot. Amen? Amen. 
We should evaluate our lives today and be honest about why we live the way we live. I would be willing to bet I'm not the only one in here that is described as being stubborn. Oh, come on. Don't, don't make me switch to lying this morning. There's some of you I know well enough to know you're stubborn. Have you ever asked yourself, how should I be living? If you haven't, I'm asking you this morning because God asked me, so now I'm going to ask you, how should we be living? The answer, like everything else, is in the book. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing, that doesn't say most things, some things, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let, let each esteem other better than themselves. Folks, that's a mouthful right there. Let me ask you, can you say that in your life you don't do anything through strife because you're mad at somebody or to cause trouble or to glorify yourself, but in lowliness of mind you put everybody above you? That's tough, isn't it? People say, well, that can't be done. Hmm. can't be done in the flesh, but it can be done in the spirit. You see, there's a lot of people walking around today with verses in their mouth and hate in their heart. That doesn't work, folks. What is required to be selfless? There's one thing, one attribute from Jesus that is required for us to truly be a selfless person. And that word is love. If we truly love each other, then we'll put each other above ourselves. Just, uh, and the easiest way to, to, to explain this is those of you that have kids. Is it any problem for you to provide for their needs before you? You know, you've all heard stories <clears throat> back during the Depression and things like that when there'll be just barely food on the table and mom and dad say, you know, I, I've had enough and let the kids eat. Why would they do that? Because they loved them. Why would Jesus come down and go through what he went through? Because he loved us. What is all he asks of us? I hear people say the Bible's so hard to understand. It's not when you know this. It is a love letter from God to us in how to live our lives in a way. And all he asks us to do is to love him first and foremost with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love each other like ourselves. If we would just simply do that, church. I told you one of the greatest prayers I had and struggles I had when he first called us into the ministry. And, and he knew, he knew, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he'd have to work on. Was I told you, I had this feeling inside me that if everything was okay in our house, everything was okay. Folks, that's not a godly attitude. If there's anybody hurting, we're to hurt. And if anybody rejoices, we're to rejoice. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Folks, I just ask you, is that, can you say that this morning? I've seen people this week that are suffering through something, and they wanted me to suffer through it so bad that they weren't happy unless I was suffering through it. Is that a godly attitude? Absolutely not. If, if I'm suffering and Ken's not, I should be rejoicing for Ken. And I should never think Ken should suffer. I want to close with this. What does love look like in us? 
If we love our neighbor as ourself, what does it look like? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. With your permission, I'm going to change the word charity in this verse to love because that's how it's translated. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. I'm going to read that again. That ought to smack us. As Adrian Rogers says, we're plowing close to the corn now, folks. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let me sum it up, folks. If we truly love Jesus Christ, it is no longer about us. It's about him and everyone else. Don't. This is not my opinion. This is the word of God. If you cannot say that about your life today, then you need to find an altar somewhere and you need to give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. If you're saved this morning, our lives must be about Jesus first and everyone else but us second. We're last, amen? Men, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. You know the Bible's clear about our role. We're to be the head of the house. We're to be the head of the church. We're to be the head of the government. We're, we're, we're supposed to be the lead. And how do you lead? You lead out of love, and you lead on your knees talking to the Father. And we need, this nation needs godly men to get back to doing what God called us to do, and that is serving others. Folks, that don't mean you puff your chest out. I'm in charge. Folks, if that's your attitude, you're, you're not a godly man. There's something wrong with you. A godly man puts everybody else in front of them. You treat your wife like a queen. You treat, your, you treat your family like you're responsible for teaching them the scripture because you are. It is in scripture. Folks, you are to be what God called you to be. And folks, it goes, it's not just the men, it's the men and the women. God called us to be godly people, godly instructors. It very clearly says, women, you are to teach the younger ladies how to be Christian women. Men, you are to teach the younger men how to be godly men. Folks, that has been missing for far too long, and it is time that we bring it back. And you can only do that when you focus on others and not yourself. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you a very serious question. I've heard from people in the past few weeks who just were not sure about their salvation. And folks, they, they're facing death. I want you to be able tonight, when you lay down in your bed, to have peace in knowing that if you do not wake up tomorrow, you will be in the presence of Jesus Christ. If you do not have that peace in your heart, friend, listen to me. This could be the last opportunity you get to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm not trying to be dark. I'm just being honest with you. There is no guarantee you make it home today. If you do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior, he's offered you another chance. This could be the last chance. Now I want you to be honest with yourself. Can you truly say that you love Jesus Christ and others more than you love yourself? Do you put others above yourself, or are you selfish? Friends, our flesh is selfish. Don't kid yourself. Every one of us can be selfish. That's the flesh. Have you crucified the flesh? You cannot please him and live in the flesh. If you're here this morning and you need to crucify that flesh, this altar is open. I won't hold you long, but I must give you the opportunity to make that decision if you want to make that decision. You see, it is the only way to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. It is the only way to go to heaven. Is As Jesus says, to pick up your cross and follow him. We must be Christ-like. 
We won't be perfect, don't misunderstand me, but we can be better and better and better. We can be more like our Father, more every day. If you have a need of any kind this morning, we can pray with you. There's power in prayer this morning.